the wrong song. We need the, um, are you ready for some slapping tonight? Get down, my man. Everybody's coming over tonight. <laughs> we need Hank William Jr. to write a special rendition. Are you ready for some slapping tonight? Apparently Hank is too busy to make a special rendition to play before actually slabbing, but we are still gonna slab, of course. So lots of small things have happened on the mill since the last you saw it. This is the last that you saw the mill where we did the bare minimum to at least get one slab made before Matt and Johnny had to head to the airport. The blade guards weren't on, the gearbox motor wasn't mounted, and we were pulling the carriage with a rigging setup so that we could be a safe distance from it. It definitely worked and was exciting, but the next step was adding a way to mechanically lift and lower the saw head beam to adjust the height of the blade. All of the parts for this were actually made when the whole team was here, so it was just a matter of attaching it in the correct spot on the mill, then lifting the motor into place. Now, with a stretch of chain that connects the motor to both Acme rods, we can rotate them up and down to raise and lower the beam. Oh, and we also put on the blade guards. Well, actually, I ended up leaving town the same day that Matt and Johnny did, and I was gone for a week for a different event. During that time, though, Scott and Cody worked to get the wheels tuned up, the blade tracking, and getting those blade guards put on. When I got back, there was still plenty to add on, but we couldn't wait to slab up something, so we went ahead and grabbed onto another log and threw it on the bed. This is a cedar elm that actually a local viewer gave me whenever he heard that I was building a mill. I used a tractor to get the slab over to the bed, then these really cool tongs to get one end up first and then the other. <laughs> wow! Aren't those tongs awesome? I saw them on a clearance rack and picked them up hoping that they would be as useful as they looked. Once the log is up on the bed, we would move it forward enough, then throw the bed supports in and push the log all the way against them. <laughs> Don't push over the mill, April! Sorry, man, it's all Since none of us have experience in this, we used logic that made sense to us on where to make the first cut. Lowered the blade down and pulled the carriage along using the strap again. Of course, a winch has always been part of the plan, but it was going to be a few days before it arrived and this tied us over in the meantime. After getting the first cut done, we then started cutting two and a quarter inch slabs. Again, we don't know what we're doing yet, so I don't know if this is the norm, but since it will be nice to end up with eight quarter wood to sell, we cut them at nine quarter. And man, look at the inside of this one. It has so much spalting and bark inclusions in it. Moving over each slab to get a look inside the next cut is the addicting part of this hobby. The anticipation and suspense is so exciting. Wow. Right, oh my let's set it down here. goodness. And then we'll Perfect. Look how beautiful this one is. Wow. This awesome. is so exciting. <laughs> wow. Look how awesome. beautiful. At this point, we don't have the winch installed, so I'm pulling it. We don't have the lubrication system installed, so Scott is dribbling water on the blade as it's running. And we don't have a remote, so Cody is having to turn it on and off at the BFD, which is inside the control panel. Which might put off some from using it, but not us. In fact, Aaron heard we were slabbing and decided to join us. Then the neighbors heard we were slapping and also decided to join us. By this time, we completed the cedar elm, so we went after a nice hickory log I got from a local arborist. This time, I filmed while Cody used the tractor to set the log on. They revoked my tractor license. Push over one mill. Okay, now we really needed a slabbing party song because that is what this quickly turned into. This was a Friday evening and we had kids on the bleachers, scaffolding, and adults with cold beverages beer and we all took turns pulling the mill even the 13 year old wanted to jump in and make a cut we were all having such a great time that even whenever it got dark we just pointed all of our vehicles towards the mill so the headlights could keep us going i don't have any job site lights but we do have vehicles with lights yeah before cutting more slabs we took the time to install the winch lubrication system and a pendant remote See, before, Cody quickly installed a toggle switch to control the up and down of the saw head beam, but was still having to turn on and off the mill inside the control panel. He had a four-way pendant in his hoarding, so he quickly wired that in so on, off, up, and down can be controlled from this remote. This will soon be upgraded to a six-way remote as Cody, being an engineer, wants even the forward and back motion to be electronically controlled, which is of course fine by me. Aaron and I have a running joke that Cody needs a show called Pimp My Bandsaw. 
he did offer to add a few subwoofers, but I told him it wasn't necessary. Apparently I didn't get any footage of the lubrication system or the winch being installed. So I'll just cut to after the mill got painted so I can show you. First off on the winch, they started with a single speed winch with an eight to one gear ratio, which turned out to be way too slow. So they quickly changed that to a two speed winch, which offers a four to one ratio. And that was definitely much better. Scott and Cody tried out a few hooking on and routing paths for this winch, but ultimately settled on fabricating two arms with pulleys on the ends, which got welded to the end of the bed and then latched onto an eye welded to the drive side of the carriage. This means that the carriage is being pulled from one side and actually pushed from the other. And this setup works out really well. Then the lubrication system. Before this was installed, we were using water to keep things lubricated, but the permanent plan is diesel which I found really surprising. I didn't know that kerosene and diesel were really common for milling. Uh, diesel is just cheaper. You can see that this big container we set right on the saw head beam, kind of in the center, and then Cody rigged up some plumbing that will go from its downspout into a T and go out to either wheel. On both sides, there is a control knob and a sight glass, which can control how fast the fluid is dispensed. From there, it drips down to, um, I don't know what the correct word for this is, but it's, it's a very coarse like sponge material, maybe wool. This absorbs the fluid and rides on top of the blade so that it constantly lubricates the system as it's running. Okay, and with those three upgrades, we got serious. People have been asking if we have logs big enough where I'm at to really use this mill's capacity. And while we certainly don't have the variety or the massive girth like the North do, we have plenty of species that will use either the entire length or width and sometimes both capacities. This is an 11 and a half foot ash that has two crotches. It's 53 inches at its widest. And again, going back to the point I made in the first video, since I'm building it myself, I would much rather this mill be more than I need most of the time than not enough some of the time. Oh, something else we started doing was leaving the slabs on as we were making the cuts. The idea behind this is to not only keep weight on the log, which keeps it still while cutting, but also prevents us from having to move the slabs twice. However, for recording purposes, I told Cody we needed to see inside this ash log and I just could not wait. So we muscled the slabs off the bed to have a peek inside. And let me tell you, while these slabs are beautiful, I mean, look at that heartwood showing through. They are extremely heavy. So a funny thing started happening with our logs. They were starting to come out pink. This happened first when we were cutting into the hickory, back when we were using water as a lubricator. And we just thought it was that one log. But with this ash also having a pink tint to it and us switching to diesel, we were believing that we were somehow creating it. I posed the question to my Instagram audience to see if anybody had experience with it. And the leading assumption is that the wood was somehow reacting and oxidizing with the air. However, I would love to hear if you have a different answer though. Oh, and I thought this was a great shot to show off utilizing the blade guides. You can see as I'm turning the winch with one hand, I'm using the other to feed the guide in and out so that it's always hugging the log as close as it can be. Cody is also doing the same with his guide and this really helps with making a flat cut. Even though we still had more logs to slab up, I wanted to get the mill cleaned and painted for this video. So I put a halt to the fun activities and brought in teenagers for the task of removing all of the rust before painting. Thank goodness this fell on spring break and the teenagers were looking to make some money. Both were geared up and then trained on how to operate a grinder with a wire cup wheel and then spent the morning and afternoon getting after it. And they did such a good job after wiping it down with rags, it looked like brand new steel sitting there. And then next up was priming. I'm not great on picking out which paint to go with. So I called PPG and told them what I was doing and they told me what I needed. When applying the first coat, it went on good, but not very solid. The oldest and I had two rollers and would get all of the flat surfaces first, while the youngest was given a paintbrush to get into all the nook and crannies that we couldn't reach. We made a first pass over the entire mill, then came back and applied a second coat. On the second coat, it was really easy to level out and also had really great coverage. It only took a gallon and a half of primer to cover this entire thing. This is gonna look good. And apparently with this paint, you can't prime and paint on the same day. So we let that sit overnight and started painting the next day. 
Just like Cremona, I went with black for my mill, and man alive, was I impressed with this paint. Because we had such a solid layer of primer down, this paint just glided on. It was thick, but smooth, and I was also crazy impressed with just how much it covered, and also how drastically different it looked afterwards. While we're painting that, let me answer a few common questions I've been getting. Yes, I am going to be building some sort of shelter over the mill. I do want to protect it as best as I can, but I don't yet know what I'll be doing. Maybe a roof built directly on top of the mill, but probably something larger to also provide shade to whoever's operating it. And then yes, I also plan on putting it on a slab. I didn't pour the slab first because I still have grading for this entire area to do, and I want to make sure that I'm going to be keeping the mill in this spot. You can believe that I'm gonna be pouring a slab bigger than needed so I can't push it off the edge. Revoke my license, give me that tractor. Okay, back to painting. While the body is black, I went with a custom plum color for the wheels and blade guards. This is a color I've adopted for some of my shop equipment that I absolutely love. And I thought it would not only be unique to my mill, but look cool in contrast with the black. Something else that was going on during this week was trenching for power. We had been running a cord through a shop window to plug it in, but if you watch the shop building series, then you'll know that I had a new power pole and 200 amp service brought in for my shop. So to get power to the mill, all we needed was a new trench from the pole to the mill. Sounds easy, right? Well, I live on solid rock, so it takes a lot more equipment than just a strong back to get a new trench in. So call in the rock saw guy. I love watching this piece of equipment work. The saw he's using is 60 inches in diameter and 4 inches wide. In case you're curious, the teeth are titanium carbide that hit the rock as the wheel is spinning to break it up. It's crazy quick though. I mean, this entire line didn't take more than 40 or 45 minutes. After they packed up, next was running conduit and a wire. While Scott and I were painting, Cody was actually running to town to gather all the supplies needed and then started connecting joints. They first brought out the wire on the ground so that they could thread on each joint of conduit instead of fishing it through later. Cody chose to go with a four conductor 240 volt circuit so that later on we can add a few 120 outlets to this area as well. They went to each joint of conduit and used PVC cement to glue it together and then put it in the trench. Now the mill has a 100 amp breaker that will make it independent of the shop. On the mill side, this line feeds into a junction box. In the future, Cody is going to rework the entire control panel to include a mainline disconnect and other protective circuitry so that the main power can be turned on at the panel, whereas right now it's just turned on at the breaker box and then the motor controls are handled by the pendant. After the guys were done wiring, Cody used the tractor to fill the trench back in and moved on. At this point, the mill had dried for a day, so next we put everything back together. And that's really the only problem with waiting until it's all done to paint things. You get it all working and tuned in, then you have to take it all apart to paint and then retune everything once again. The chain up top was rerouted and tensioned, the motor was dropped back into place, the blade was tracked again, and the guards were attached. Woo wee! I know I'll get plenty who don't like it, but I love the look of that plum and black. Now that it's back together, of course we had to throw on another log. This time we picked up a short but wide oak log. I was actually told by the local arborist who cut this one down that it was ash, but as soon as we cut into it, you could see that it was oak. When we set this one on the bed, it was clear that the log would sit much more flat if we flipped it over. To do this, Cody moved it forward on the bed as far as it would go. We wrapped a chain around it and he pulled it back. That was Cody catching it to absorb some of the impact of its fall. And there we go. That actually sat much more evenly. There is a science behind cutting logs. And after I have some time under my belt, pick up tips from either viewers or experience, I'll make another video dedicated to what I've learned in case you're interested. Put your hand down there, Rick, so I can have a scale. <laughs> That's a big slab. That's a big slab. It's beautiful. It now we've come a long way, but there are still a few add-ons that will be coming to the mill. One is a guard around the motor belts. You can see there on the left that this is a danger zone when the mill is on. So that is definitely a priority. 
Another handy add-on will be a digital readout, something that will digitally call out the height of the blade. Right now we're having to turn off the mill in between cuts so somebody can manually pull a tape to come down two and a quarter inches, which is what I'm slabbing at. Oh, and because I'm anticipating lots of questions on how I'll be drying these. Yes, I'm exploring the kiln option, but for the meantime, I picked a spot in my trees to make a few pallets and let them air dry. In this location, they'll get a good amount of shade, but plenty of airflow. Now the important thing about making a bed is to make sure that it's flat. If there's a twist in the setup, then the wood will follow that profile and you'll have a twist in your wood. Then since we're slabbing and leaving them in place on the mill, at the end we wrap a few straps around the log to keep things together, then use a chain to pick up the entire thing and move it over to the bed location. A little bit too. These are not light. They're not light at all. But stickers. they're beautiful. Stickers? Oh man, oh, stickers. Shoot. I gotcha. <laughs> I mean, I'm coming. Okay. We're new to this. <laughs> Sticker. Yeah, you should keep that in the film. Oh yeah, I definitely will. Okay, go ahead, gentlemen. Once here, we can offload it one by one, but this method means that we only have to move each heavy slab once. It's important to brush off the sawdust on both sides of the slab before leaving them to dry because the sawdust will absorb moisture and create mold, which is of course not something that you want. You'll also see that we're using spacers in between each slab. These are called stickers and they're just little standoffs to allow air to move in between each slab so that they can dry out. Same principle as the bed. It's important that these stickers are the same height so that everything is resting nice and flat and the boards will dry flat. That's exciting, guys. Oh, and I think that's gonna wrap up the bandsaw mill series. But don't worry, you will see the mill again as I improve it further. If you're interested in watching me slab up logs, then be sure to follow me on Instagram. I use that platform very actively to post smaller adventures of mine. You know, to date, this is the biggest group project I've worked on, and what a grand project it's been. I hope that you've enjoyed watching this come together as much as I have. Uh, that's it. I will see you on my next build. He's like, I found some shade.